What's good kings and queens? Hope everyone's week is going well. This week's video is on the end of an era in boxing. With that being said, let's start the video. The heavyweight division in America used to be the center of attention. In order to be the best, you must travel to America to make your voice heard. The popularity of the heavyweight division was so massive that it casted this shadow across other weight classes, preventing to gain notice with their talent. America had a massive stable and a political stronghold over heavyweight as there wasn't really much competition. The only competition really were fighters from Soviet Union and Cuba, but they were not allowed to turn pro and fight professionally, thus plateauing their career as a fighter. When the Soviet Union collapsed and former Soviet republics began to stabilize, as the 90s was a very grim period in Eastern Europe, you began to slowly but surely see talent emerge from these new governed nations. Coming into the 2000s, the amount of talent that America was producing was few and far between to take the throne for the new era, as the 90s era heavyweights were beginning to make their exits out the sport or begin to fade. A lot of people say the next great heavyweight American is playing in the NFL, that they're going to other sports and stuff. But it's not just because the NFL is there, it's always been there. It's because there's no marketing going on. There's always a football field. How many boxing gyms are there? Tyson vs. Lewis would be the turning point. After defeating America's biggest cash cow, he had vacated all his belts but the WBC and IBO. He would then face Vitaly Klitschko, then retire. HBO's first effort to revitalize the heavyweight division in America in partnership with Top Rank, signing Mike Tyson to an $80 million deal after his final fight on his Showtime contract. Tyson losing to Danny Williams would make them ditch those efforts. Ukrainian Vitaly Klitschko would win the vacant WBC title but was forced to vacate it and retire just a year in as champ due to a knee injury. American and former heavyweight champion Haseem Rotman will be awarded the title in today's words by email as he was promoted from interim champion to champion upon Vitaly's retirement. American Chris Bird will pick up the vacant IBF title against Vander Holyfield. John Ruiz would defeat Vander Holyfield for the WBA title, then lose it to Roy Jones Jr., then regain it again against Fred Okendo. He would get dethroned by James Tony, but Tony would test positive for a banned substance. It was then switched to a no contest, and Ruiz would be re-rewarded the WBA title. With the European contenders now in line for the titles, the European takeover of the heavyweight division would start on December 2005 and sweep 2006. Ruiz gets dethroned by the Russian giant Nikolai Valuev. Just a couple months later, Vladimir Klitschko defeats IBF champ Chris Bird. Since this is before the WBO is made a legitimate title and recognized by all belt organizations, very strangely out of all of this, Vladimir was removed from the WBO ranks, though he had defeated Sam Peter in a title elimination bout. That wouldn't matter anyway, as Belarusian Sergei Lyakovich defeats WBO champ Lamont Brewster. By summer 2006, there was only one American belt holder, Hasim Rotman, and he was up against Uzbek Kazakh national, but newly nationalized to Russia, Oleg Moskayev. Moskayev defeats Rotman, stopping him in the 12th and final round. Where have you gone, Joe Lewis? A lonely boxing nation turns its eyes to you. All four heavyweight title belts belong to fighters born and raised in former Soviet republics. So if the heavyweight division is dying in America, it is alive and well in Eastern Europe. To complete the takeover, Vladimir Klitschko travels to Madison Square Garden to face contender and U.S. hopeful, the 29-0 Calvin Brock in November of 06. Klitschko stops Brock in the seventh round to retain his titles. And Wayne Kelly's gonna stop it! A knockout win for Klitschko! Lyakovich 
would get dethroned by American Shannon Briggs in one of the greatest finishes to end the era in American heavyweight boxing. Briggs' reign would come short and he would lose the title against Sultan Abragamov. By 2007, all the power politically rests in Europe to where you see more Americans traveling overseas to fight for the title or make a name of themselves. These nations' TV networks, advertisers, and investors have been waiting many years to have a heavyweight title fight in their backyard as they were blocked from having such privileges, which you can tell from the production for these events. Now they have have that power and from what it looks like with the heavyweight picture it's going to be like that for a long while David A is going to be my 50th knockout the fifth man of the system knockout on 2 July Boy this is going to be an exciting fight are you ready Absolutely I go and take my brother so this is most suiting to have these back to back. However you want to look at it, Don King's influence and the fights he made helped carve up some of the most iconic events in boxing history. Don King put this together. It was not a color put it together. You understand? I'd like to call him the Messiah. What led to King's downfall was his shady business practices and taking advantage of the financially illiterate. Though King did claim he provided services to fighters to help them become more financially literate, invest their money in the right places, given how history is with fighters outside of King's stable and how they refuse to learn such vital skills where their earnings are drained before retirement, you can only put but so much blame on the promotion or the promoter. You can only teach someone who is willing to be taught. I think a prime example of a fighter from an incredibly volatile era of fight purses who became financially literate and kept pretty much everything is Larry Holmes. The 30 for 30 doc shows a young Larry building his dream house before his biggest fight against Muhammad Ali. Then fast forward to present day, Larry is still in that very same house he built. Larry is the ideal fighter to learn from when it comes to having flash and moderation, learning the trade and not getting stuck in the game. With that being said, Don had way too much invested in the heavyweight division. So much to where it seemed like whenever a prospect or a champ from the lower weight class lost, he sat them on the shelves to collect dust or low budget, ill promoted matches. You have the undisputed welterweight champion fighting on an undercard than to fight in a relatively small venue in New York. Guys like O'Neal Bell, Luis Colazzo, Joseph Abeco, Travis Sims, the list goes on for champs who lost and just vanished. Don had a chance to sign the Klitschko's in the late 90s, but due to his fakery, the Klitschko's didn't fall for any of these tricks and passed up on his deal. With the heavyweight division and America's influence falling apart in the mid-2000s, these powers going to Europe, King had no stable to fall up on, and fighters who were signed were quickly trying to get out of their contracts as King's deals with TV networks were beginning to wither away. As Showtime, who Don King was with, was beginning to shift their attention to the lower weight classes. How do you promote and unify this thing? Because for 11 rounds and two minutes and 30 seconds, this was not a, a fight that was worthy of a heavyweight championship title. That's so your, how do you, that's you, your opinion. Well, it's the opinion that I think of everybody who was opinion, watching as well. And that opinion would have had any, some validity to it had it not been the knockout. But since there was a knockout, who's to say that Shannon wasn't planning it all the way? To pinpoint when exactly the arrow is officially changing the hands of power and the influence will no longer have a push will be on June 2nd, 2007. The last of the US heavyweight title holders, Shannon Briggs, who is promoted by Don King against Sultan Abragamov. Sultan beats Briggs for the WBO heavyweight title and in this European article, it brilliantly states that the monopoly returns back to Europe. Donald Curry will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, amateur boxer to, to not win a gold medal, with the record of 400 wins and 4 losses. He was not allowed to compete in the Moscow Olympic Games due to the United States protests of the USSR putting boots in Afghanistan. By the time Curry got into, into title contention, Sugar Ray Leonard announced his retirement and Thomas Hearns was campaigning at junior middleweight. Curry would pick up Leonard's vacant WBA title against Korea's junior 
Queen Sakwang. He will then unify against IBF champion Marlon Starling. A year and a couple defenses later, Curry is now unifying against Milton McRoy. It's 1986, Marvin Hagler is on top after defeating Thomas Hearns. Sugar Ray Leonard is supposedly retired for good. Roberto Duran is at the bottom rebuilding his career. Outside of what's happening at heavyweight, Donald Curry is on the cusp of being one of the faces in the sport due to his dominance of the welterweight division. All of that would come to a halt when the WBC mandatory and 5-1 to underdog Lloyd Honeygan pulled off the upset defeating Curry. So there was some drama leading up to here. When Curry was the undisputed champ, he asked Ray Leonard and his management for an advice if he should move up to face Marvin Hagler. They told him no. Then fairly shortly after that advice was made, Leonard comes out of retirement to face Marvin Marvin Hagler. Curry then tried suing Leonard for $1 million in financial damages. In Curry's campaign at junior middleweight for the WBA title against Mike McCallum, Curry wanted Leonard removed from the broadcast team for this fight due to their beef. Up on all judges' scorecards coming into the fifth round, McCallum would finally have Curry locked in for the perfect punch, laying Curry out. As this was still possibly a pending lawsuit against Leonard, the commentator Barry Tompkins tells Leonard on the broadcast, you settled a case out of court here. This was named Ring Magazine Knockout of the Year. This would completely end what would come up of the Curry era and ironically start the new era of the long reigning champ, Mike McCallum. After Manny Pacquiao's loss to Floyd Mayweather, the Manny train continued to pull, defeating Tim Bradley in their third fight for the WBO international title, then to defeat WBO champion Jesse Vargas. Manny would then lose the title against Jeff Horn. Due to the media backlash at the time of the results, Manny had one last go on top. He would face newly crowned WBA regular champion Lucas Matisse. Manny would look impressive against Lucas and gain the WBA regular title. Please keep in mind, keep Thurman is a true WBA welterweight champion as he holds the super title. The Lucas fight was under Manny's boxing promotion, with Manny already not in the best relations when his contract came to an end in December of 2016. When it came to his fight with Lucas Matisse, ESPN Plus, which is under Top Rank, supposedly got the rights to air the fight in the States. Not only Top Rank, but a few other parties failed to pay Manny the rights to air the fight. So pretty much they illegally streamed the fight in HD for hundreds and thousands of people while they raked in subscription sales. Manny sued them for not making their payment and for future MP promotion fights he will restrict them from getting the opportunity to buy the rights till the payment is made. I cannot find any sort of updates so I'm assuming it was settled out of court but these relations are definitely severed as Manny would sign to PBC Al Heyman and also take his promotion and stable of fighters with them. Those notable fighters being Isaac Pitbull Cruz, Mark Mosayo, and John Ray Casimero. Manny's first fight under the PBC Showtime banner, he fought Adrian Broner, who would outclass and outshine Broner to a unanimous decision. This would set up the fight against the real WBA champion, Keith Thurman. This would be the fight to either, depending what happens, end the Pacquiao era or keep on chugging as Manny is now 40 years of age. Manny would turn back the clock and get the split decision victory over Thurman to set up what would be a super fight against Errol Spence Jr. With Spence's car accident and the pandemic happening, this really messed up setting up this fight. By the time it was set up, Pacquiao was already made champion in recess and mandatory challenger Udanis Ugas was promoted to champion. To avoid a Graciano Rossigiani situation, which Ugas would have every right to bring the WBA to court over and win by a landslide, using the Graciano vs. WBC case as an example, the WBA made the wise decision of revoking Manny's request to restore him as a champion, making it a unification against Spence Jr. Just 10 days before the fight, Spence was forced to withdraw due to a torn retina. Ugas was already in camp, came in as Spence's replacement. The winner fights Errol Spence, and well you know, the winner of that will go on to fight Crawford for the undisputed title. Manny will come up short and lose by unanimous decision. He would immediately announce his retirement and announce he would be running for president. Back with the video in a short bit, be sure to hit that like button so all the rest of the good folks can see the video. This video's comment section topic is, what is your top three favorite weight classes in boxing? And what is the matchup you have been eagerly waiting for in those weight classes? Leave in the comments. Thanks for sticking around and let's get back to the video.
the era of the Golden Boy came crushing down abruptly, with HBO at doubts who would hold the torch. After Oscar's mega fight with Floyd Mayweather, he was preparing for the rematch. He had a tune-up fight against Steve Forbes, with Mayweather Sr. back at the helm as head coach. Do I want my son knocked out? No. Do I want his ass whooped? Hell yes. He needs it. This was also Oscar's first non-pay-per-view fight, and it was held in an outside venue. Due to the immediate success of HBO 24-7, since this was an Oscar fight, the HBO Countdown series will receive the 24-7 production treatment. I'm not the greatest of this time, that time, poor time, part time, but of all time. This is the story of a boxing legend seeking a storybook ending. With one of the best ending montages that no one saw. At the catch weight of 150, Oscar will put up an impressive performance against Forbes, getting the unanimous decision. The HBO team was quite confident that the Mayweather rematch is a done deal for September. The outcome mean to that possible fight? The fight looks like it's virtually a done deal. I can guarantee you one thing right now. I will beat him. I will. Yeah, will you guarantee when you're going to fight him? Uh, well, the date is not set in stone yet. There's nothing signed, but... Uh... With Floyd Sr. in my corner, I will get him. Little they knew, Floyd's bluff for retirement was real, and there was a scramble to get a replacement. The replacement will be newly crowned WBC lightweight champion, Manny Pacquiao. Manny had shown incredible prospects in his first fight at lightweight against David Diaz. With Manny's growing star power and large hardcore Filipino fan base, he was the best option for a big fight replacement. This was met with scrutiny on Oscar's end, as this was seen as a mismatch against the pound for pound star. The Filipino government tried to get Manny's license revoked, blocking Manny from fighting De La Hoya. This ultimately failed, and Manny continued on his journey to welterweight. To later shock every boxing analyst, Manny would one-sidedly beat Oscar, shaking up the boxing world. Oscar would immediately retire from the sport and focus on his promotional company. In 2003, Roy Jones was on the top of the world making history gaining the WBA heavyweight title against John Ruiz, then to move back down to light heavyweight to defend his light heavyweight title against Antonio Tarver. Jones would get the majority decision win, and this would open up for a rematch. He would then get thrown by Tarver in the second round. This era would come to an official end when Jones faced Glenn Johnson just four months later for the IVF title. Down on the scorecards, Jones would get knocked out again in the ninth round. Roy would bounce back up and down in the ranks over the years. After a four plus year win streak, after his loss against Dennis Lebedev in 2011, by September 2015, Roy Jones is ranked number 11 by the WBO. If he were to get past Enzo Macronelli, he just may have cracked the top 10 WBO ranks coming into the 2016 year and be granted a GIF retirement title fight against the champ Glavosky. Jones would unfortunately lose against Enzo and that shot would go to Steve Cunningham. So this is being built in London, actually. Right. Where we found Everything a seems to be in Europe and not in the US. Yeah. Gary, it's, it's, it saves on the shipping. If it stays in Europe, it's going to stay in Europe, isn't it? I mean, not a chance. From the 90s to the mid 2010s, the political power in the super middleweight division was dominated by Europe. Up until the Super Six tournament, the biggest, most significant fights were made there. Once the tournament ended, it was right back to Europe. For a fight to go on air, um, say something like that is putting not only Ken in a very difficult spot, but the rest of the promoters because it's almost as if their team's not doing the job they should be doing. I get to be at home for my three fights, and it's a big advantage for me. My phone was lit up after that. It's something he should have just kept his mouth shut about. The shift of power slowly started back in 2017. Padu Jack, a Gambian Swede who predominantly fights in America, was unifying against James DeGale. This would end up in a draw. Jack would move up to light heavyweight. James would get dethroned by Caleb Truax. DeGale would regain the title, but he would shortly vacate it. American Caleb Plant will pick up the belt. The WBC title, it should have went to Callum Smith as he was the number one ranked fighter and silver champion. The vacant belt should have been fought between him and Eric Skogland, but instead it was for the WBC diamond belt. Benavides, who was number four, was given the rare privileged opportunity of fighting 
challenging for the vacant WBC title against number 9 ranked Ronald Gavril. Now from June 2017 to August, Gavril would magically move up in the ranks to number 6. Benavidez beat Gavril to become champion. Callum Smith would win the super middleweight tournament and become the ring and unified champion. Now the division really is in a political split. IBF and WBC is residing in North America within the PBC Showtime networks. WBO and WBA is in Europe within Eddie Hearn and The Zone coming into 2020. That would come to a change when Canelo fully started his campaign at super middleweight. Canelo first went after Callum Smith. Due to Benavidez not making weight in his previous fight prior to the makings of Canelo Smith, the vacant WBC title will be fought between them. Canelo beats Smith and gets the WBC, WBA, and ring titles. He will then go after Saunders for the WBO. Then all what's left is the IBF. Canelo crosses over to Showtime PBC and beats Caleb Plant for the title, making it so that the biggest money fights and the political power is now back in North America. Something that has not been seen since Sugar Ray Leonard's brief stay in the weight class before heading to Europe. With Canelo in power, right at the door, David Benavides, Caleb Plant, Christian Mabili, and David Morrell. The Three Kings era defined 80s and American pop culture. The era would slowly come to an end when Marvin Hagler retired from boxing immediately after his defeat against Leonard. For Leonard, it would be after his fight against WBC champ Terry Norris. Leonard's influence and power was so large that he was able to get a shot at the title at junior middleweight out of retirement despite his last championship fight, which was almost three years prior, was at super middleweight. Leonard would lose lopsidedly on the scorecards to Terry Norris and go back into retirement. Duran rebuilds, loses to Vinny Pazienza, which was highly competitive to where it spawned a rematch, loses again, defeats undefeated prospect Roni Martinez, loses to Hector Camacho, have a two-fight rivalry against Jorge Castro with Duran coming up victorious. Duran will get the retirement title shot package to fight newly crowned WBA middleweight champion William Joppy. Joppy makes short work of Duran, stopping him in the third round. For Thomas Hearns, Hearns would dethrone the undefeated long-reigning champ Virgil Hill for the WBA light heavyweight title. Hitman Hearns! I want to say hello, hello to my grandfather. He's 108 years old. Grandpa, we get it again, baby! In his first defense, he would lose the title in his rematch against Iron Barkley by a razor-thin split decision. Now, you can say this fully ended the era, but Hearns kept on going. He moved up to cruiserweight, which he was actually looking good winning regional belts. But the problem was he did not fight outside of that regional realm, peaking at number 5 in the Ring Magazine rankings in 1993. Due to not stepping up, he was delisted from the rankings. What we have scheduled is for Tommy to Hitman Hearns to go again on February the 19th in the Charlotte. We're going to try to put Bobby Chez in with uh, Wumba. If we can get Bobby Chez in Wumba, the winner of that will be fighting Tommy Hearns. So it's coming right in a progression and maybe by April or May that be, he'll be the cruiserweight champion of the world. Too little too soon, Hearns would find himself in the UK fighting for the IBO title against Nate Miller. Hearns would earn the unanimous decision and, and pick up his last world title. In 2000, Hearns would get dethroned by Uriah Grant due to a knee injury and he would retire from the sport, putting a full end to the Three Kings. When Chavez received his first moving him entirely as a clean sheet record holder, Chavez had a new goal of trying to become the first fighter to have 100 fights with no loss. So Chavez would have several fights in the same year in between his mandatory title defenses. If he were to get past mandatory opponent Frankie Randall, Chavez would have most certainly met his goal by the end of 1994 and retired from boxing. He lost to Randall foiling his plans. He would beat Randall in the rematch, but he fought way less his usual average Average, but still fighting at the top of the sport. In 96, Chavez would get dethroned by De La Hoya. It was stopped on cuts, so Chavez still remained at top. The Chavez era would officially come to an end, losing to De La Hoya in the rematch. 
The influence was still very strong during Ali's retirement after defeating Leon Spinks in the rematch. Larry Holmes was not the original opponent to face Ali. It was supposed to have been against WBA champion John Tate. Tate would lose the setup fight against Mike Weaver in the final round and the rest was history. Ali by this point had to select to fight his former sparring partner and WBC champion Larry Holmes. Ali was not the same fighter he was two years prior, and what really didn't help at all, he pretty much ruined any chances he would have against Holmes by taking thyroid medication to lose weight, doubling the amount of dosage, causing some serious damage to his system to where he had little to no energy to fight. This fight would be unfortunately dragged out for 10 rounds due to the incompetent ref, and it would be finally waved off in the 10th round after Dundee literally screaming at the ref to stop the fight. Stop he said, that's lost. He, he handled it with dignity. Check him out. Oh, Angelo wants to stop the fight. And now I'm bargaining with him. Angelo Dundee wants to stop the fight. That's it. And on top of that, that's the end of an era, part one. For more installments, be sure to like, share, and if you're new, subscribe. Subscribe to the Patreon for patron back projects and early access. This project is on the tale of Prince Nassim Hamed versus Kevin Kelly and Floyd Mayweather versus Ricky Hatton. I'm Alfa Sancho, and I'm out.